Good morning folks, it is Sunday morning, the 7th of June, uh, and welcome as we gather together for our slightly altered service this morning, just as, as we worship together on this Sunday. Uh, for those of you who are observant, or those of you who have looked online already, you'll know that I am not in uh, Strain this morning. I am actually down in Carador and Ballyfrenis. Uh, and anybody who's really smart and really um, cued in, if you have a look at that picture, I wonder if anyone can spot what is wrong with it. Um, you might notice that the clock is on the wrong side because I'm using the selfie camera. Um, so just in case anyone's wondering, that doesn't look like our church, everything's back to front. Well done, well spotted. It's just because of the camera that I'm using. But welcome this morning as we gather to, to worship. Um, in a moment, I'll do the birthday blessings, uh, but I only have one announcement to make this morning. Uh, and this is for the family of Strain, just to let you know. Uh, just, to let, just to inform you that one of our members, Wilson Carson, um, passed away this week uh, on Tuesday and there was a private service held for Wilson on Thursday. Uh, we continue to remember his wife Jacqueline, um, his daughter Julia and son Patrick at this time. Let's just pause right at the start and let's pray for them. Father, uh, as we gather this morning, as we come to worship you, we do remember the Carson family this morning. I just ask that you be with them. We remember Jacqueline um, in the nursing home. We remember Patrick and Julia and their families. I just ask that you be with them and bless them this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that we gather and be with us as we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's great to see the different names popping up and down on the screen. Um, if you try to send me a message this morning about a birthday, apologies if I miss it. I already have a note of some birthday blessings. So let me do the birthday blessings this morning. Um, first of all, to say that from Strain Matty Bell, you were 16 last Thursday. Hard to believe it's 16, Matty. So happy birthday for them. Uh, somebody has a birthday tomorrow, who is David McClymond. David, you're going to be 39 tomorrow. Uh, so happy birthday for them. Somebody else who has a birthday this week on Wednesday is Stuart Bowl. So Stuart, happy birthday. Um, it, it's lovely just to be able to, to say that to you this morning and a few other people as well. I don't know what exactly days your birthdays are, but Emma Hill from right, right from here in Carador, um, happy birthday to you as well. And also to Cara McAvoy, it's your birthday this week as well. So birthday blessings to you all. Um, let's just pause and give thanks for those birthdays. Lord, as we do gather this morning, um, we are reminded we, that we are part of your family that you are with us, that you're close to us, that you look after us um, at every twist and turn along the road. So Lord, we thank you for that. Father, for those people who we've mentioned this morning with regards to birthdays, um, Mary and David, Stuart, Emma and Cara, uh, we, just, we just thank you um, for them and thank you for their families. Lord, for birthdays that have passed, birthdays that have been coming this week, Lord, just bless each and every one of them. And for anybody else, Lord, who's had a birthday, just may they continue to know your hand upon them, your blessing with them, now and always. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, folks. Um, just as we do gather this morning, just a few verses from a psalm, I, again, I heard this past week. Some people might have heard this being read as well on um, TV, on different things that are happening. The start of Psalm 37. It says, Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. You know that last verse, commit everything to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. God really does help us. And everything that comes along in life, God is with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's always by our side. What a great, big, wonderful God we have. You know, the kids sing a chorus, we have a great, big, wonderful God. And that's true. We have a God who loves us and who cares for us, who's always there. A God who is really, really amazing. Now, boys and girls, we're going to talk about God for a minute. I'm going to talk about something which he made. So I've been talking, to, I've started a wee series on different pieces of fruit. So, so far we've had a banana and we've had an apple. Herbie, do you like an apple? No. You do? I see. Really good for you. 
No, no, I'd say, yeah, you've got to watch your teeth and you're doing it. Well, this is a different sort of fruit this morning. Um, I'm going to hold a picture up in a minute, but let me give you a few clues. It's red. It's smaller than an apple. And I'll tell you this, it's not a strawberry. So, Herbie, if I hold that picture up to you, they got, first of all, do you recognise those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do? I wonder if anybody else will be recognised. Let's see if we can get a picture of this online. Now, I wonder if anyone knows what those are. Have a think for a minute. Sometimes you might eat them as they are. Sometimes you might turn them into juice. Or maybe you like to turn them into a sauce and put it on some turkey at Christmas time. They're cranberries. Like, I didn't know some things about these cranberries. And I learned something amazing about cranberries this week. Herbie, this, this is something for you. Yeah, do you think we're cherries? Yeah, they look like cherries, so they do. Picture's deceiving. You can't really tell the size from a picture. Cranberries are amazing. Because whenever God created and designed cranberries, he designed them with a little air pocket in them. So that as cranberries grow, the air pocket grows as well. So that whenever it comes to harvesting cranberries, they're harvested in a really unusual way. So they've grown on the fields and they're, they're, they grow quite low down in little bushes. And then when it comes to harvest time, the fields that grow cranberries it with banks and the reason they're surrounded with banks is because whenever they come to do the harvest they flood the fields and whenever they flood the field what they do then is they they stir up the water uh, and they make it all choppy and that shakes the cranberries loose from their plants so that if you can see in that picture let me cover my face a minute it's a better picture than looking at me the cranberries float to the top of the water so that the farmer can gather them together. Isn't that incredible? How God created cranberries and then how we harvest them. He made them floats. He, he designed them in a way that that would happen. You know, one of the most famous Bible stories, boys and girls, involves something that will float. Something which God designed, which he got somebody to build, that would float and would look after people and look after his animals. Noah's Ark. Think about it. Uh, people hadn't seen rain. People hadn't really uh, had that experience. They'd never seen a flood before. And all of a sudden, Noah starts building this ark in the middle of nowhere. And people wonder what's going on. He tells them there's danger coming. But they can be saved if they get on the ark. God created it and designed it. God sends all the animals along uh, to stay on the ark to preserve them. And, and then Noah speaks to the people. But they don't listen. God was angry with the people because of what they were doing. But he saw Noah and he wanted to save Noah and his family. He wanted the opportunity for people to be safe. People just needed to trust God and get on the ark. Unfortunately, most of them didn't. But God made it that they could be saved. God made and designed something to keep them safe. He made something that would float and take them through all that was lying ahead. God does the same with us today. God holds on to us. God holds us close. He wants to look after us. Boys and girls, it's really unusual times that we're living in at the moment. There's no school going on. Uh, there, there, you can't go out and play with your friends the way you normally would. Uh, people are not coming into your house. Maybe you're meeting outside in your front garden. Maybe you're in the back garden. Maybe you're shouting across the street to your friends. We just can't do things the way we used to. But God is still with us. And God is still looking after us. We just need to trust God. A little small word, but which takes an awful lot to do. Just remember that this week. And as you think about school and about trying to get back to school, just remember God loves you and cares for you. And he is with you every step of the way. Let's just pause and let's pray together. Let's pray, boys and girls, for you this morning. Um, Anybody who's in P7, you got your skills this past week. But I know there's some boys and girls didn't get their skills. Let's pray for those who didn't get their skills. And let's just pray about a few other things this morning, just as we meet together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for how you designed everything. Thank you for how you've made everything. God, you are wonderful. You are great. You, you understand everything. The things that we don't. 
We thank you for how you've made cranberries, that they can float and how they're harvested. But Lord, we thank you for how that reminds us of the ark, how you designed something to float to save Noah and his family and all the animals because you loved them and cared for them. And fellow, you love and care for us. So thank you that you're with us all the time. Lord, for the boys and girls um, who got their skills this past week, for those who are in P7, thank you for, the, for, for that. Thank you that they've got their skills. Lord, for those few who haven't got a skill yet, we just pray that you'd be with them, that you would just remind them of your presence, remind them that you are looking after them. And Father, we pray that this would get sorted out sooner rather than later. Lord, thank you that again it's Sunday and be with us as we continue to worship you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls, for listening. Um, I'm going to read God's word now. So if you want to listen, please listen on. I'm going to read something again, which I read last week. I'm going to read a slightly different translation this week. But we're going to read together again Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. This is what it says. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen worlds, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armour so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. Amen. The end of Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20. Let's pause. Let's give thanks for God's word. Let's ask him to speak to us. Let's also remember um, everybody else who's doing the same thing this morning as they're streaming. Let's remember our moderator as he um, puts together his first service for this morning. Uh, and let's just talk to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have given to us. How you speak to us through it. How you guide us and direct us. How you encourage us. How you discipline us. How you tell us off when we do things that are wrong. How you build us up and bring us closer to you. Lord, your word is incredible. And we thank you for it. Help us, Lord, just to take time to read it each day, to listen to you, and to hear what you're saying to us. Father, we know that we're not the only ones doing this this morning, that we're not the only ones coping with this pandemic. We know that right away around the world, it is all the same. So, Father, for churches and groups of believers, wherever they may be this morning, whatever way that they are trying to get your word out, either through this or through a different medium, Please be with them all this morning. We pray for all those who are working the technology, Lord, that it would work. We pray for all those who are speaking your word, that you would give them your words. Lord, just that even in this time of trouble and despair, that your word would bring peace and comfort to many. That people, Lord, who don't yet know you as saviour would simply trust you this morning. Father, we remember our new moderator, David Bruce, this morning, and we remember his first service as it is transmitted. Again, Lord, we ask that you would bless that service, and that you would use it in a mighty and a powerful way. And just that you'd be with David over the time that lies ahead, that you would give him wisdom, 
guide him and direct him. And for William, Lord, as he steps back now, that you give him a time of rest with his family. Lord, we continue to remember our church family. That's the church right the way around the globe. And Lord, I ask that you be with each and every one of them this morning. For those who are mourning, that they would know your peace and comfort. For those that are hurting, would know your healing hand. For those who are in despair, Lord, that they would just feel your comforting arm around them. For those who can't see a way ahead, Lord, that they would take hold of your hand and allow you to guide them this morning. And for all of us, Father, that you would help us as we seek to help each other, that you would guide us in that. So, Lord, thank you. As we come now to your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just take a wee drink. Folks, this passage in front of us is very familiar. It's one I'm sure you've heard time and time again. I know it's one that I have preached about in the past before. And we read this passage last week and we started into it last week. But again, there are still so many things that this passage can say to us. I left it last time at the belt of truth. And talking about what the truth of God is. Let's just remind ourselves about that. God always speaks truthfully to us. God doesn't tell us lies. If he said something, we can, as we would say, we we can count on it or you can bank it. Because if God says it, it's true. How many of us can say that about ourselves, that we always speak the truth? You know, we do tend to manipulate and change things at times, don't we? To suit our own purposes. We maybe leave things out because we're afraid of hurting somebody. We maybe add something in, again, for the same reason. We don't want someone to be hurt. It's very easy for us to twist the truth. When we think about this passage, when it says about putting on the belt of truth, it reflects back to what comes before it, that we are fighting an, an enemy which is not flesh and blood, but which is evil of the unseen world. That's the way Paul puts it the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. When you think about that for a minute in relation to truth, and you think about how God always speaks truth, look at what Satan, the devil, did right at the very start. You know, when you go back into Genesis 3, it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? See, right at the very start, Satan starts to twist and distort what God had said. And then whenever Eve had replied, Satan again comes back with another lie. You won't die. But they did die spiritually. Their relationship with God was changed forever because of that sin. So whenever it says about putting on the belt of truth, that's an exact opposite to what Satan does. He wants to tell us lies. He wants to destroy the truth. God wants us to hold on to the truth. To hold it firm because the truth is what we have. The truth is that God made us, whatever way you look upon that. That God loves us and God cares for us. That God is always there for us. And that God right at the very beginning, whenever things started to put, fall apart, again put something in place for us, which Satan would try to deny. Now that comes down to righteousness. So you have put on the belt of truth. And then you have the body armour of God's righteousness or the breastplate as some translations put it. What is righteousness? What does that big word mean? It means being right with God. It means getting our relationship with God fixed. And you see right at the very beginning of Genesis, God had a plan. God always had that plan. Because Genesis 3, the serpent tells a lie to Eve. She goes on, he tells another lie. Eve eats the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She shares it with Adam. And then whenever they speak to God, they know that they have done wrong. And then God turns to Satan and says this to him. I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That is often seen as the first reference to the coming of Christ. He will strike your head. He will destroy you. You will strike his head. Yes, you will try and hurt him. He will be crucified on a cross. But he will defeat sin. He will make things right again. 
You see, this armour is a process that we go through. Some people go through this process really quickly. Some people take years to go through this process where they eventually realise what God has done for them and come into fellowship with God. We start off, first of all, by realising who God is. That God is exactly who he says he is. That he is the creator of this world, the creator of us. We then have to realise that God has done something for us to make us right with him. Let me give you another reference for that. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord led on him the sins of us all. Again, Isaiah was speaking about Jesus, about what Jesus would suffer for us, what Jesus would do for us so that we could be right with God, so that we could have righteousness. And again, we have to realise that. We have to realise who God is, the truth. We have to realise that he gives us righteousness, that he has given us a way where we can get to know him, a way whenever we have our relationship with him fixed, healed, restored, whatever word you want to use for it. What comes next in the armour? For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Peace that comes from the good news? You know, I've listened to friends and I've listened to different people in the past before who said that they went through periods whenever they had no peace, whenever they felt so troubled, um, whenever they knew that their life wasn't right and they were battling against God. Sometimes we call that the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We say that's how God works in your life to tell you that you need him. And some people will tell you about how for weeks on end, they are just tormented because they know that they're not right. They know that there's something they need to do. And once they realise that and they, and they give themselves over to God, they have peace. They have, have comfort. It's like a weight lifted off their shoulders. Let me read this to you from Philippians. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Peace. Only God can give us that peace. And we understand that peace from reading his word and just from letting God speak to us. Have you put on the, the shoes of peace yet? Or are you still walking on stony ground on bare feet? Are you troubled? Do you, do you battle against what's going on in your heart and in your head? Give yourself over to God's peace. You see, we often talk about, you know, it, it's one thing having knowledge in our head. We have to let it get into our hearts. It has to get into here first anyway. We have to start and, and, and read God's words and listen to what God's saying. It has to get into here. And then God brings it down into our hearts. And God's spirit works in us to let us give ourselves over to him. So let me read. For shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news that you will be fully prepared in addition to all of this, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. There's an action there. There's something that actually happens. It says, hold up the shield of faith. Now, not many of us have seen um, in real life a, a battle going on which involves armour. Maybe you've been to a reenactment and you might have seen it. Maybe you like to watch movies of it all. You know, sometimes on TV we see all of these. And maybe you've watched something which you see soldiers who are fighting who are wearing armour. Do you see any of them who are carrying a shield having it dragging by their side? Do you see it built, clipped onto their belt whenever they're fighting? No, you see it in their arm and they're holding it up and they're using it. They have to lift it up so that it can, it can work. 
Paul calls that the shield of faith. Now, what does that really mean? To hold up the shield of faith? Well, if you have the belt of truth on, if you, if you do you think, okay, so God, okay, you're, you're God. You've made me, you care for me, you love me. Okay, I'm going to trust that word. Yes, okay, you've got, um, you've, you've given me a way to make me right, which is Jesus. And yeah, I'm troubled at the minute, but I, I know from reading your word, I know from what I've heard and what I've been told, that you will give me peace. Now we have to do something which is called exercise faith, or have faith, or have trust. Because faith is what makes the difference. Faith, by actually saying, okay, God, I am going to trust you. By doing that action, okay, okay, I'm going to give myself over to you. I'm going to allow you to change me. I'm going to allow you to transform my life. James puts it this way. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that faith save anyone? Or in Ephesians it says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't, can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. God wants you simply to have faith and to trust him. And whenever we do that and we hold up that shield of faith, then he puts his arms around us and protects us. Then we put on the helmet, which is salvation. And God holds on to us as his own child. You see, all of this armour works together. You just can't have one part of it. You need all of it. All of it for it to work together. All of it for God to change and transform you. You see, we forget that to be a Christian, to be a follower of God, we've got to lay ourselves bare before God. We've got to let God into every part of our lives, not just a little part, not just today, which is Sunday, but every single day, every single part of our lives. He's going to change it all. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20. Whenever all of this comes together, and with, the, with the helmet of salvation, then God changes and transforms us. It's not instant. It's an ongoing process. We'll still get it wrong. We'll still stumble sometimes. We'll still fall. Maybe we'll want to turn and run away. But God holds on to us. And the armour is there to help us. Yes, it's a process we go through as we approach salvation. But then once we've let God into our lives, we need to keep reminding ourselves of the truth of God's word. We need to keep reminding ourselves that we've been made right because of what God has done for us. We need to keep reminding ourselves that we have God's peace in our hearts. We need to keep reminding that we do have faith and it's there to hold up so that we can stand against the devil and his evil ones in this world. And we can remind ourselves that we have on our heads a helmet, which is salvation. We are saved. We are born again. We are a child of God. We have personal faith. Whatever phrase you want to use, that we belong to God. And then we take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the only part of the armour, which is a weapon. And it's this. It's the Bible. We can use this in this battle. You see, let me go back to Psalm. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Psalm 119 verse 105. And there's lots of other passages which talks about God's word and how it guides us and how it directs us. That is our weapon. If we want to know how to live, we turn to the Bible. If we want to know how to battle Satan, we turn to the Bible. Look at what Jesus did when he was tempted. He quoted the Bible. That was his strength. That was his weapon as he fought back. But this is no good to us unless we open it. 
And there's been a lot of talk this past week about President Trump and how he was trying to hold the Bible. And somebody said at one stage he was even holding the Bible upside down. And people have talked about how um, he, he, he didn't see, he, you know, he obviously never opened the Bible. Um, I, you know, there was a man on and he, he talked about how to hold your Bible. It was a, there was a bit of fun in it. But he talked at the end about how to hold the Bible like this. Open Bible, open heart. And that's so true. When we open God's Bible and we read it, God starts to open our hearts and change us and transform us. God guides us through this. He leads us through this. He tells us off through this. He encourages us through this. He tells us that we are not alone, but that every step of the way that he is with us and he is fighting for us. And we are told, if God be for us, who can be against us? This is everything that we need. I wonder what are you like this morning? Have you started to put on that armour yet? Have you started to realise what God has done for you? If you haven't, I would urge you today, really, truly, consider what God has done for you. The sun is shining outside. Well, well, it is down here in Cairo at the minute. It might be a bit windy, but just look at, the, at what's around you. Open your eyes and see the wonder of God's creation. How can we deny God when we see this? Start to realise what God has done for you. And just open your heart to him. He wants to change you. Have a little bit of faith and let him do that. And for those of us who've already done that, Yep, life is difficult. Life is a battle. But let's remember something. Satan can't be everywhere at once. Let's not give him more power than what he's got. He's the fallen angel. So yeah, if he's bothering somebody else, he's not bothering you. Yes, he has other angels around the world. But you know, we are in ourselves. We like to go our own ways. We like to do our own things. So there's a certain amount that is built into us which always rebels against God. But remember, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. If you've put your trust and faith in God, he's living in you. And he wants to change and transform you. Just let him into every part of your life. Break down the doors. Let him get into all those dark corners that you're hiding. Let him shine his light. And let him change you. You will not look back we have a great and a wonderful God who will guide us and direct us if we let him your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path how will God guide you this week let's pray father thank you for how you equip us for life Thank you for everything that you give to us to help us, to encourage us, to build us up. Lord, help us to put that armour on day by day. Not just one part of it, but every part of it. Help us to use it all because we need every part of it, Lord, to be able to stand for you. Lord, when things are difficult, help us to draw strength from you. When things are getting us down, help us to turn to you. When things are going well, Lord, help us to keep turning to you and to keep drawing strength from you. And in everything, Lord, we acknowledge that you are wonderful and great and we are here because of you. So, Father, we thank you. Help us this week, we pray. In Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with us this morning. It's been great to have you along. I just pray again that this week that you would know God's blessing, you know God's peace, his strength, his guiding, uh, and that you would stay safe. So take care. God bless. See you again soon.